On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Curtis Franco and Mr. Brian Chi here today. And we talk a little bit about network-based printers and just how useful they are for businesses, but they're also a network vulnerability as well. Plus, we have a great guest today, Mr. Mike Bartel. He's Toby Pro's Director of Marketing Research and UX. And we're going to talk about the fascinating research around developing eye tracking and just how it can help your organization make some critical business decisions. Shouldn't miss it. It's Wyatt on the set. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to making securing your employees simple and secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 421, recorded December 4th, 2020. Eye tracking cod pieces. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Thinks Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60 day money back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the how do you hear about us box. And by Worldwide Technology. Worldwide Technology is advanced technology centers like no other testing and research lab with more than a half a billion dollars of equipment, including OEMs like Dell Technologies, and it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that it offers, go to WWT.com slash twit. And by IT Pro TV. Don't let another year go by. Get a head start on your IT career with IT Pro TV today. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use code enterprise30 at checkout. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreski, your guide through all things in the world of enterprise. But I need help. I need help in this guide, in this journey. And I need to buy the experts, the professionals in the field, starting with our very own enterprise and security expert and journalist over. He's also the senior editor over at Dyke Reading, Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis Happy holidays, my friend. What's been keeping you busy over the last couple of weeks? Well, thank you so much. It's uh, It's been an exciting time. I was on a holiday, an extended holiday around Thanksgiving, so got a lot of things done around the house. Now I'm eager to be back in the saddle at Dark Reading, also getting ready for thank Black you. Hat Europe, which is next week. So lots going on to keep us busy and lots of great new information coming our way. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Well, speaking of busy, we have our very own Mr. Brian Chi. He's the geek in paradise, and he's calling in from the great state of Hawaii, but not for much longer. How's it going over there, Chibert? Yeah, I am surrounded. Well, actually, I'm actually in my moving pod, getting ready <laughs> for everything. The contractors are busily um, doing some siding repair, and also the carpet is going. The new carpet's going in. So we should be ready for a house appraisal for next week. Well, good luck in all of your journey there. Well, speaking of busy, it's not only the last month in 2020, it's also pretty big and, and exciting time for IT Enterprise News. So we not only got some breaking news and another announcement from Salesforce, but we're also going to talk about network-based printers, they, how useful they are for businesses, but they also could be a vulnerability, too. We'll talk about it. Plus, we have a great guest today, Mike Bartel. He's the, actually Toby's Pro's Director of Marketing Research and UX. And we're going to talk about the fascinating research around eye tracking and just how it can help your organization with some critical business decisions. But before we get to all that goodness, we also have to jump into this week's blips. Now, if you're a client or service developer, you've probably used NPM before. The Node Package Manager has established itself as a staple in many development communities. You probably have integrated it in your CI loop as well. Now, if you're using the NPM, you're highly dependent on a tool and a catalog of packages as well as the security behind it. Now, anytime you have strong dependency on something like that, it also opens the door to potential attack vectors as well. Now, this past week, a security team behind the NPM repository for JavaScript libraries removed 
two NPM packages for containing malicious code that installed a remote access Trojan, or RAT, RAT, on the computers of developers working on JavaScript projects. Now, the name of the two packages were jdb.js and db-json.js. Now, the same author created the packages and described themselves as tools to help developers work with JSON files typically generated by the database applications. Now, both packages were actually uploaded on the NPM package registry last week. They were downloaded more than 100 times before their malicious behavior was detected by Sonatype, a company that actually scans packages repositories regularly. Now, according to the security team, the two packages contain malicious scripts that executed after web developers actually imported and installed any of the two malicious libraries. Now, the post-install script performed basic reconnaissance of the infected host and then attempted to download and run a file named patch.exe, now VT scan. Now, the later, they actually later installed NJRAP, also known as Blotabindi. Now, this very popular and remote access Trojan has been used in espionage and data theft operations since 2015. The patch.exe loader modifies the Windows firewall to add a rule to whitelist its command and control server before, before pinging back its operator and initiating the RAT download. Now, all the behavior has contained into a jdb.js package only. And in fact, that one actually downloads the second one. Now, while the NPM security team publishes security advisories every week, most of them are usually for vulnerabilities and packages that may be exploited in the future. However, since late August, the NPM security team has been seeing an increased number of NPM libraries that have been intentionally put together to steal data from infected systems, suggesting that several threat actors are now interested in compromising programmers' workstations. Breaching attempts don't stop there. They actually target credentials for sensitive projects, source code, and intellectual property, or even prepare large supply chain attacks as well. Now, what does this mean for your organization? Well, it means you can't just stop at using the security advisories to help you along the way. You're going to need some additional tooling and maybe even some services to assist you in maintaining possible vulnerabilities. Well, someone is targeting COVID-19 vaccine supplies, and it might just be a nation state actor. Individuals in multiple organizations that are involved in the COVID-19 vaccine supply chain are being targeted in an organized spear phishing campaign that appears designed to harvest their online credentials for future attacks. At risk, data associated with critical components and participants in the so-called cold chain that ensures safe preservation of COVID-19 vaccines during storage and transportation. Researchers from IBM Security's X-Force team, who discovered the threat, described the spear phishing campaign as spanning six countries and targeting entities associated with Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, and the Cold Chain Equipment Optimization Platform, CCEOP, program. According to IBM, the campaign, especially the victim targeting, has all the hallmarks of state-backed activity. However, the vendor stopped short of actually identifying any group or government that might potentially be sponsoring the activity. The phishing messages pose as requests for quotations related to UNICEF's CCEOP program and contain malicious links intended to harvest credentials. In all, IBM has counted at least 10 organizations in six countries that have been targeted so far. All the phishing emails IBM has uncovered so far impersonate the same single key account manager from Hire Biomedical. One-way attackers will try and monetize, monetize stolen credential data, use it to launch ransomware attacks, according to a warning from the researchers. Uh I'm sure you've started seeing a lot of ads for these sweet new power supplies based on gallium nitride. So you can have a much, much smaller power supply that provides a heck of a lot of power. It's becoming very popular, especially for machines that can run completely off a USB-C interface. Well, we have an announcement from Navita's Semiconductor about their solution. In this case, they're pointing out that billions of dollars and billions of gallons of water are used every year to cool data centers. But a new gallium nitride DC to DC converter can help reduce heat loss and improve data center efficiency. Navita Semiconductor Limited and Density Power Solutions have created the industry's first 400 volt, 300 watt standard quarter brick DC to DC converter using 
gallium arsenide fast power ICs for high durability applications. I'm not going to read that model number, but the converter provides a tightly regulated 28 volt nominal output and follows the industry standard DOSA quarter brick package, which is actually 60 by 39.1 by 12.7 millimeters and pin out for simple installation and upgrade. It has the world's best in-class power density of 10 watts per cc and two times to five times more power than any dosa high voltage quarter brick converter according to the press release now interestingly enough 400 volts dc is what we actually use on the aloha cabled observatory so that we lose less power on long undersea power runs um, simple physics the higher the voltage the lower the power loss over long haul um, runs. So if we can go hundreds of kilometers at 400 volts, it should also work nicely for data center runs. The part I need to ask about is how do we get the 400 volt DC in the first place? I guess if I'm doing the power feed outside the building, at least the hot stuff is outside with natural cooling. Now, you probably remember the Patriot Act. It's been the center of many controversial surveillance debates in the past. However, Section 215 of the Patriot Act adds to the controversy. Now, enacted after the September 11, 2001 attacks, Section 215 of the Patriot Act permits the FBI to obtain a secret court order to collect any business records deemed relevant to national security inquiry, a straightforward standard for investigators to meet. Now, the legal authority for it and two other surveillance-related uh, investigative tools and collapsed for new questions earlier this year, although the FBI can still use them for pre-existing cases. Now, Section 215 has been at the center of repeated fights over the balance between empowering national security investigators to detect potential threats and preserving America's privacy and freedom to read what they want or call other people out without fear of government observation. Now, in the Bush years, civil liberties advocates actually raised alarms over the possibility that the FBI might use it to monitor people's library records. Now, in 2013, an uproar actually erupted over the disclosure that the National Security Agency had secretly used to collect bulk logs of all Americans' phone calls. The ban actually demands to ban using Section 215 for library records gradually faded. It appeared that in practice, the FBI was not using it to monitor what books people had checked out. And Congress en ended the use of Section 215 for bulk collection of data in 2015. But new tensions actually have emerged over the extent to which the FBI could use the law to gather logs of people's web browsing activities instead of using warrants. Now, this tool requires investigators to first be able to produce evidence that a person probably engaged in wrongdoing. But Section 215 expired in March 2020. Now, in May, the Senate voted to reauthorize the Freedom Act. However, the bill staled pending rec reconciliation within the House. Now, without further ratification, the agencies continue to order web browser history collection in the future. Let's just see how it will take for changes to happen to see if this goes away. Well, you know that great new next generation endpoint protection? Researchers just bypassed it. Just because your endpoint security product employs machine learning doesn't mean it can't be manipulated to miss malware, according to new research. A pair of researchers will demonstrate at Black Hat Europe next week how they were able to bypass machine learning-based next-generation anti-malware products. Unlike previous research that reverse-engineered the next-generation endpoint tool, such as Skylight's bypass of Silence's endpoint product in 2018, the researchers instead were able to cheat the so-called static analysis malware classifiers used in some next-gen anti-malware products without reverse-engineering them. They first tested their attacks using the open source static malware classifier tool Ember and then were able to take that attack and use it against several next gen AV products. They snuck known malware samples past the products by modifying some of the exploits file features, things like checksums and timestamps, which allowed them to fool the static classifier into believing the malware was made up of legitimate files and not malicious software. Researchers say the attack could be pulled off easily, but defending against it? Well, that's difficult. According to the researchers, this is a generic problem from machine learning and falls into the category of adversarial machine learning. Adversarial ML seems a long way off to many businesses, but even standard ML-based security tools are susceptible to these next-gen attacks. 
Well, we have a short video clip about a really new product coming out from the folks at Salesforce, and we want to thank them for letting us have a quick peek. In fact, this video has been under embargo for a couple of weeks, and we bring it to you now. Well, folks, you know I'm the CRM guy. CRM is near and dear to my heart, and I love to hear about new products and new technology that go along with it. And today we have Melissa Matra. She's the Senior Vice President of Product Management at Salesforce. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Now, we uh, obviously have had Salesforce on before, but we love having them on because they always bring us new technology and how the market's changing. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about this new technology, the workforce engagement product, and just how it's going to shift the market and how it's going to help customers out there? For sure. This is uh, targeted to the contact center. So it's going to help service organizations quite a bit. Uh, this is an evolution. Workforce engagement is an evolution on an industry that's been around for about 30 years called workforce management, which is largely around operational efficiency, how to have just the right number of agents to meet the demands of customers. So we are evolving this to really take into account how to ensure you get the right person at the right time with the right skills to solve your problem and provide quality customer service experiences. So I say some of the features that are included in it are forecasting work demands and then planning what types of agents you need to staff those work demands and then um, training opportunities for those agents so that you can make sure you have your workforce and your, your, your customer uh, facing uh, workforce set up for success to deliver the best service. Fantastic. Now, this is interesting because obviously during the pandemic, during the COVID-19 period, the workforce has changed. How can this impact those different organizations and how can it change their inefficiencies here? For sure. Uh, there's, uh, first of all, this space has a lot of challenges because uh, contact centers are really dealing with a lot of disparate systems. They may have their workforce planning tools on one platform, their CRM on another, and their routing on another. And so what that means is that when it comes to a time where suddenly you have your uh, entire contact center distributed because they're working from home, uh, there's a lot of gaps in the data and you have to be able to adjust very quickly to dramatic shifts in your in your um, inbound demand from customers. And so we've seen a lot of um, challenges coming from customers and heard a lot about this where uh, they can't keep up because they're doing so much manual data entry that they, they can't get ahead of all of the shifts in customer needs. And then you have the agents who are dealing with balancing uh, their work life. They have kids at home that they're homeschooling. They may have to take care of someone. They may not have the right technology at home or the connectivity they need. So your, your, um, your staff is less reliable in that sense and less consistent in their hours that you used to be able to staff them against. And then finally, obviously there's contact centers that may not be able to operate because the location they're in may have been hit by um, COVID more more than another location, and they may have to shut down. And how do you redirect the customer inbounds that are coming in to another area and ensure that all of your customer needs are being met? Melissa, um, our viewers are going to want to know, is this a standalone product that you're announcing or does it have some dependencies? Do I have to be in a Salesforce customer already to use this? You do not have to be a Salesforce customer already to use this, although you're going to get a lot of uh, extra miles out of being a service cloud user because you're able to really connect all that data um, right on the same platform and have that ease of use of being all of the time to value and the setup and the consistent data flow. But we will, we are set up to allow for integration um, from other platforms as well. And um, and they should be able to use that as well for if they're not on Service Cloud. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm interested in, a lot of companies are touting machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, some mm -hmm. sort of intelligence 
in their platform to to make up for a lot of the competitive pressures that are out there, along with the challenges of the way the workforce is deployed. Yeah. How much does this depend upon those or are you sidestepping that entirely? Yeah, I, I think um, AI and automation is really interesting in um, how we've approached this space. First of all, um, when you think of artificial intelligence in the contact center, I think one of the first things that comes to mind are chatbots. And um, chatbots take a lot of the cases that agents would have previously taken. Um, and this is actually, um, this tool is really meant to help support the human side of the workforce continue to be engaged and grow. So as chatbots or even self-service are taking a lot of the easy cases and deflecting, like I need to reset my password or where's my package. Um, the agents actually have the opportunity to take on more challenging and meaningful cases. And so part of the product offering we have in place is in-moment training so that the agent can be uh, routed training modules right on their shift that help them keep up with the, the questions that are coming in and the skills they need to address those questions and also help them have a career path going forward as the easier cases are take on, taken on by AI. The other piece of how we're looking at AI in this is on the planning side. So where a planner may be dealing with a lot of manual data entry, um, we've seen stats that about 60% of workforce planners are still using spreadsheets. And when they're working with a lot of manual data entry, they have to spend a lot of time curating that data to make sure it's good quality data to get a decent forecast out of it. And so we're leveraging the power of machine learning to, re to be able to look at the data, provide a forecast and say, hey, here's an outlier, this doesn't seem right. And flagging it for the planner so that they, they can focus on producing the best forecast without having to dig through all the data on their own. Melissa, thank you so much for being here on TWI and telling us a little bit more about workforce engagement and just how it can really help organizations. Can you maybe tell the folks at home where they can go to learn more about Salesforce and just more about workforce engagement? Sure. Um, we have a product page on salesforce.com. The URL is right down here at the bottom of the screen. And um, and there's um, a bunch of different articles we've put out and we're excited to bring this new product to market. Thanks again for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you again to Melissa for being on. This is actually a pretty interesting space. We'll have to have Melissa on again to talk more, more about workforce engagement. Well, folks, Facebook is back in the news, and they continue to be newsworthy when it comes to security, privacy, and bending the rules and regulations. The United States Department of Justice sued Facebook this past week, arguing that the social media giant discriminated against U.S. workers by giving preference to Facebook workers on H-1B visas who wanted to transition to permanent jobs at the company. The H-1B visa program lets foreign workers work at the United States companies for at least three years. It can be renewed once, and after that, an employer can ask for permission to offer the immigrant a permanent job under the Department of Labor's PERM certification program. But the employer is supposed to first advertise a job to see if any Americans are available for it. Only no qualified Americans apply can the job go to the actual immigrant. Now, in the lawsuits, the Justice Department argues that the Facebook's hiring practices made a mockery of these requirements. Most Facebook jobs are advertised online and job seekers can apply online. But by contrast, Facebook overwhelmingly places legal mandatory mandated ads for perm jobs in print publications. Candidates were required to submit their applications by mail, not online. Now, these jobs had an average salary of more than $156,000, yet out of 1,128 jobs posted between July 2008 and 2019, 81% didn't receive a single applicant, while another 18% received just one. Now, quote from the Justice Department here, if a U.S. worker applied to a perm-related position and Facebook determined that the U.S. worker was qualified, but there was no non-perm-related vacancy available for the U.S. worker, Facebook's standard operating procedure was to decline to hire the U.S. worker for the perm-related position and to temporarily abandon or, sus or suspend the perm process. Now, the government argues that Facebook's hiring practices con constitutes illegal discrimination against U.S. workers. It asks the court to order Facebook to overhaul its hiring practices pay a fine, and provide back pay to workers who were illegally denied jobs. The fine is potentially a hefty sum given the number of jobs involved here. 
Now, the process and protocol has been around for a while, and many large organizations attempt to work around it because they need to quali- actually qualify people immediately. Now, as the DOJ starts to target some of these organizations, it is a hope that it will actually deter others from trying to do the same. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Thinks Canary. Now, with everything that's going on in the world, Thinks Canary wants you to know they're here for you. Data breaches are on the rise, and companies usually find out too late that they've been compromised, even after spending millions of dollars on IT security. Now, this is where Canary can step in and ease the process. Canary is designed to be installed and configured and deployed in minutes, and you no longer have to mess with your network after that. Plus, alerting is made really easy. Canary gives you the option of deciding how you want to be told, whether it's either email or text message right there on your console or you're using collab services like Slack, webhooks, or even Syslog or even their API. Now, alerts should be dead simple and easy to work with, conforming to your needs and not the other way around. Now, Things Canary has made that possible. You won't be flooded with alerts. You receive only the ones that matter. Now, when you're thinking about data breaches, there are two things you should know. Hackers take the path of least resistance, which is your staff, plus data breaches are hard to detect. It takes on average 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. Now, this is where Canary can help. This is how it works. It looks identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, or a Windows server, so attackers can't tell the difference. Now, Things Canary, they don't look vulnerable on your network. They look valuable and appealing. You could put fake files on them or even enroll them in Active Directory. And when attackers investigate, they give themselves away and you're instantly notified. The company behind Canary has been in the security game for almost two decades. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments on how to break into networks and have used that knowledge to build Canary. Things Canary is deployed all over the world on all seven continents and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Now visit canary.tools slash twit and for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five Canaries, your own hosted console, upgrades, support, and maintenance. And if you use the code twit in the how to hear about us box, you'll get 10% off the price for life. We know you'll love Things Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with their two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. That's Canary dot tools slash twit and enter the code twit and the how to hear about us box and we think thanks canary for their support of this week in enterprise tech well folks it's now time for the bites now many businesses find it a necessary evil to have a printer deployed on their network right obviously model businesses need print printers now allows for easy productivity and resource traffic but working remotely was growing more common even before the coronavirus pandemic accelerated the trend. And as workers increasingly settled in their home offices, they still need access to company networks and office hardware, particularly printers, which is actually interesting. The pandemic led to a spike in the sale of home office printers as well. And as an edge device on the network, it needs to be kept secure all the time. However, the scenario poses a challenge for IT personal working to secure increasingly decentralized networks in today's hybrid working reality. Now, it highlights the challenge of protecting traditionally unforeseen targets, which obviously are printers, against intrusion and compromise. Now, that's increasing importance because according to a late, late uh, a recent report, a uh, global print security report, 59% of businesses in the UK, US, and Europe have experienced printer-related breaches in the past year. That's actually quite a lot. Now, the rise of Internet Things means today's printers can contain several potential entry points for networks and sensitive data. Now, organizations need to prepare for such a threat. Now, print, printing systems can experience straightforward interrupt, interruption of service attacks as hackers exploit old firmware versions to take over and halt the operation of the device. But they can also be subjected to more sophisticated exploits, such as men-in-the-middle attacks, and they are exposed sensitive confidential data here. Now, hackers can also leverage exposed Internet protocol printing protocols ipps they those ports can actually gain access to the network now according to zdnet the print 80,000 printers nearly eighth one eighth of all ipp capable printers are exposed to their ip ports online on a daily basis that's actually a big issue for a countless number of enterprises around the world trying to transform themselves what can you do to make printers safe well there are some ideas here number one supply chain security Now, by creating a fully secure supply chain from start to finish, manufacturers can reduce the opportunities for malicious code to get in there, whether it's consumer verification, digital tracking, tamper-proof 
multi-layer packaging all play a part of minimizing the vulnerability. So that happens at the manufacturing side. There's also hardware security. Now, printers can be designed with internal resources to enhance their security, including multi-layers of protection, help detect and remediate attacks, as well as firmware plays a role here as part of the security architecture, making it essential to protect the firmware's code on the device. Now, number three, chips with built-in security and proprietary firmware can help protect against third-party interference at the point where information is transferred from the print from the chip to the printer. Now, number four, proactive testing and improvements. Now, any firmware is only as good as its code, and manufacturers must pro proactively test the security of them to ensure that they can withstand malicious attacks. And finally, keep your devices up to date. Keep the firmware up to date. Now, I do want to bring my co-host in because we've talked a lot about some of these things in the past. Now, Chibert, I want to go to you first. Uh, we preached the last one before, right? Keeping your devices up to up to date. Now, that's the low hanging fruit to ensure the devices stay secure. But what about more drastic behaviors for organizations, like maybe making users use VPNs to access printers? Well, that that VPNs are problematic because if you're trying to print to at from your home to a local printer, that means you literally have to allow for what are called split VPNs. So you can use your local resources and also get into the corporate resources. Um, one of the suggestions that some of the people have made is make it a full tunnel all and then have it come back over the VPN pipe to your local printer, which means we're going to be using more bandwidth. So it's a double-edged sword here. Um, one of the problems that a lot of um, people have is how do you manage the software on the printers? Now, if it's a simple inkjet, not such a big deal. But if it's a large enterprise class machine, they're running Linux and they have big hard drives. And like one uh, Chumley said in the uh, chat room is, I, I love finding big business printers sitting by the dumpsters. Grab that hard drive. Well, it has images of things that you're printing which might be confidential. So you might want to consider making sure you scrub those hard drives before you get rid of that old printer. That's true. That's true. That, now, Curtis, I want to throw this to you because obviously we're talking a lot about consumer devices here. Obviously, people who are working remotely and having printers in their house but wanting to print sensitive documents. But we're also talking about the the, the printers in-house in as well. Now, the ones uh, in the house, in, in homes... You know, we talked a little bit about bug bounties in the past and how some organizations like HP and other places are having, uh, you know, are paying for these bugs that are found or these vulnerabilities found. Um, do you think that'll help here? I mean, do you think this will help for even for some of the consumer or I guess you could say prosumer business devices that end up in people's houses? Well, I think it certainly could if you turn the hacker community loose on all of these various devices and give them a bounty. Although, you know, even they would recognize that there are going to be huge bounties on most of these. Uh, I think it would have a good result. Uh, the, the real place that we've got to look at all this, though, are the big enterprise printers. Because as you point out, these are not just imaging devices now. These are devices where people can, can scan, they can store, they can do document manipulation, all of that before creating the images on paper. And it really is an issue. Even in this year of working from home, there are an awful lot of things that go on on centrally located printers. So whether you're, you're talking about printers in a residence or printers in what remains of the central offices, these are complex, highly capable devices that are also highly vulnerable. Right, right. Well, last question to you, Cheaper, because uh, we have a great guest we want to get to. But you know, a lot of organizations are moving away from allowing printing, um, and they're they're moving more towards things like you know document repositories like SharePoint or uh, you know some other places. To, um, you know, these these secured file storage mechanism. So when you're sharing something, you share it from there and then they can manage the security uh, around those documents. And then you don't have to print them and uh, unless you need a physical uh, copy of it. Um, so do you think that this is something that's more relevant to most businesses? Is that, hey, let's move away from allowing people to print, especially when they're at home, and just have them share the document instead? I think it's a great thing to do. And I think uh, elephants can fly. The, the problem is 
too many organizations are in love with paper documents. Um, my or you know, I recently retired from the University of Hawaii, and even though it was legal to use electronic documents, the university still insisted not only on a paper document, but it had to be a particular color. Um, so that was a real pain. Um, I think it's a noble goal. I think we should be moving towards it. Amazingly enough, the pandemic has actually gone a long, long way towards getting these bean counters and paper pushers to finally agree that electronic signatures are just as good. Right, right. Well, thank you, guys. That does it for the bites. Next up, we have a great guest. But before we get to the guest, we have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Worldwide Technology, known simply as WWT. Now, WWT began building their advanced technology center, their ATC, about 10 years ago, and it's grown exponentially. It's like no other testing and research lab you've ever seen. Now, the lab contains more than a half a billion dollars in equipment from hundreds of OEMs and key partners ranging from heavyweights like Dell Technologies, VMware, and Intel to emerging disruptors like Equinix. Now, WWT is a trusted partner who stays with you over the years. Many of their customers actually have been with them for over a decade because they know WWT is where they can go to get the answers they need to make sure their business runs right. Now, their ATC is an incubator for IT innovation, and it offers on-demand schedule labs like Dell's VxRail, PowerStore, Unity, PowerMax, Data Protection Central, and IDPA. Now, these labs represent the newest advances in primary storage. Now, there are hundreds of labs to explore, including multi-cloud, hyper-converged infrastructure, networking, secondary storage, data analytics, AI, and many, many more. Now, learn more about your products before you launch. WWT's engineers use these environments to quickly spin up proof of concepts and pilots using the ATC lab environment so customers can confidently select the best solutions. Now, in many cases, this actually reduces concept time from months to weeks, which increases speed to market. They actually offer lab as a service, a dedicated lab space within the ATC. Here, customers can perform programmatic testing using the vast technology ecosystem that WOT has already built, and it's virtual. So you can actually take full advantage of the ATC's unique benefits anywhere in the world 20 Four, seven. Now, WWT's engineers work in these labs every day. They beta test new equipment. They build reference architectures and custom integrations to help their customers make decisions and see results faster with much less investment. Plus, WWT has launched a digital platform ecosystem and encompassing the ATC ecosystem. Now, this is an ever-evolving platform that creates a multiplier effect around knowledge, speed, and agility. Yeah? And anytime, anywhere around the world for their customers and partners, you can get full access to articles, case studies, hands-on labs, and other tools that make the difference in today's fast-paced world. Now, to learn more about WWT, the ATC, and become a member of their growing community, go to wwt.com slash twit to create an account and gain access to their on-demand labs today. WWT simplifies the complex. That's WWT dot com slash twit wwt delivering business technology outcomes around the world and we thank wwt for their support of this week in enterprise tech well folks now it's now my favorite part of the show we actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the twiat riot and today we have mark mike bartell he is toby pro's director of marketing and research for research and ux welcome to the show mike hi lou Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, this is a super interesting topic, but before we get to that, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us on a short journey and what brought you to uh, Toby Pro? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my origin story, I was uh, getting my master's degree in psychology. It was about 2005. And like a lot of students, I was looking for a way to make ends meet uh, outside of the paltry teaching assistant salary. Uh, so I started working for a professor, had no idea what she did or what kind of research was going on there, but I quickly learned it's there's this thing called eye tracking and it's this incredible technology where you're able to uh, analyze visual attention and it's used in all kinds of different contexts uh, from scientific research to commercial research um, to professional performance research uh, and I was hooked. Um, so that was about 15 years ago, uh, and I got into eye tracking right after I graduated and have been doing it ever since. 
Now you, you brought up a good point. Like eye tracking, I've, I've experienced eye tracking, eye tracking in, in my past where we used to use it for whether it's, you know, you know thick clients, uh, you know, applications on your machine or even just websites where we used to do like heat mapping through user research. Yep. We had you know, users come in and use our applications and then we would heat map where they would look um, and and we would detect, OK, well, this is where they first looked, where they looked for navigation. And so maybe we should add some more navigation options there. Obviously, that's just one part of the market. You, you yeah. alluded to a bunch of other parts. Can you maybe take us through some of the other applications here and what can help? Yeah, absolutely. So when I got started in eye tracking, it was a lot of what you have referred to as uh, the sort of UX research, trying to design better websites that better support uh, the human visual experience. Um, in the years since then, eye tracking has become more affordable, more portable, and has applications just that run the gambit from, you know, uh, it's used in a lot of university sports programs to help with uh, concussion prevention in, in football programs. It's used on assembly lines to make sure that the, the workers are uh, following a safe and efficient process with what they're doing. Um, it's still used in a lot of user experience and shopper research to determine you know, which products are most likely to be noticed on the shelf and, and make sure people can find signage and get around the store okay. Um, but one of the, the most recent advances has been putting this technology into homes. So now the eye tracking systems can be very easily calibrated. We can send them to a sample of 100, uh, say, streaming users in their own homes and have them wear these eye tracking glasses while they're uh, using a streaming service. And then we can look at that data and determine how best to optimize the platform, where the usability issues are, and just generally to create more uh, accessible consumer experiences and, and better ways to, uh, to uh, uh, design and, and sell products. Now, obviously, we're, we're big on privacy on the show, and our chat room kind of got in an uproar when you said, hey, go into people's homes. Now, these yep. are predefined, pre-set up uh, research studies, right? They're not just, hey, yeah. a random device in your house starts collecting uh, eye tracking data, right? That's exactly right. And let me, let me be a little more specific here. So this is a set of eye tracking glasses. This is Toby Pro Glasses 2. And right. the cool thing is it has these illuminators and cameras built directly into the glass and when somebody takes part in one of our studies, we ask them to wear these glasses as they're watching television or shopping in a store or uh, using an app on their smartphone. And the glasses um, record their visual attention during that process. This is all opt-in research. These are participants who have been informed what they're taking part in and are being compensated uh, for taking part in the research. Um, so, you know, we recognize that there are privacy concerns, but this type of research is, is not something that's going on without people's uh, permission. And it's something that uh, all our participants are informed of before they take part in a study. Got it. So, so what is what is the scale for something like this? Obviously, there's businesses in all parts of the market, whether there's medium, you know, mom and pop shops, small business, mm -hmm. all the way up mm -hmm. to enterprise where where do you see this laying? Is it everywhere? Is, could it be like, hey, I'm just developing, I'm building some, you know, new manufacturing something small that goes into your house, and I'm small. I'm just a, just a starter business, all the way up to enterprise. Is can they? Is there price points to help? You know, with eye tracking yeah. in all different parts of the market, or is it just one? Yeah, absolutely. So the we do have customers all across the spectrum of. Uh, of, of size of company, um, you know, from the Googles and Toyotas and Coca-Colas all the way down to uh, much smaller companies. Um, the price point really depends on what you're hoping to learn and how big a sample are you uh, hoping to capture. Um, you know, for example, we did a study with a toy manufacturer who wanted to test you know, participants in eight different countries, 40 different cities, you know, 100 different stores. So huge scale of research, huge analytical undertaking that took, uh, you know, half a year. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have customers who are just wanting to do kind of a starter study. Maybe they want to look at the visual attention of 
eight of their uh, employees while they're using a software platform or eight users of their app. Um, and, and we do have uh, much smaller studies and, and technologies that are, are more designed for those uh, those smaller scale uh, operations and, and more basic uh, basic types of research. So it does run the gamut. I, I would say that for the most part, this is something that's being used by uh, established companies who have been around for a while, have a sophisticated uh, research program, and can work eye tracking into the types of UX or consumer research that they're already doing. Um, but it's right. it's by no means an exclusive club. Right. Yeah, I think I think a lot more retailers need to use this more. A lot of the stores are set up differently. People get lost. Marketing is badly placed. They could probably use this the technology to help. Um, one thing that you brought up that was really interesting, obviously, Toyota, car manufacturers. Toyota has their famous Toyota production system, uh, really highly efficient. How are they using it here? Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so... We can't say too terribly much about how our customers are using it. There is one study that we did in collaboration with Toyota that I, I am able to talk about. Um, and that was actually a consumer study about how people shop for Toyota cars in the showroom. So we set up a mock showroom with uh, a couple of different cars, digital materials, uh, printed brochures, signage, um, uh, the participants in the study were able to get in the cars and, and kind of like check it out just as you would if you were in a real showroom. And their questions were, you know, we can ask people what helped them make their decision about which car to buy, but what are they actually looking at in the showroom? What are they paying attention to? And are there differences across different demographic groups, um, uh, different age groups in, in what they pay attention to as they make that decision? Um, so that was a really cool study. We had some cool findings about, you know, how much attention is actually paid to the dashboard inside the car. That was kind of the main thing that people are looking at once they're in the car. Uh, there were some cool findings about uh, younger shoppers being much more likely to engage with the digital screens than uh, than older shoppers as they're evaluating the cars. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things that, that we did in that study. Again, there are other uh, research approaches that our clients are taking um, that I can't really get into too much detail on, but that's, that's one that, that I am able to talk about. Right, right. Well, we do have a lot more to talk about with Mike, but before we get to more, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that is IT Pro TV. Now, the last month of the year is here, and now is the perfect time to work on your New Year's resolutions, like finally diving into switching your career and learning IT. Now, if you desperately want to look at a new career or learn more about the IT field, that you're already in. IT Pro TV is exactly where you want to go. Now, earn IT certifications through IT Pro TV's online, super entertaining IT training courses. Whether you're an individual or even part of a team, you'll enjoy your IT education with them. Now, improve your IT skills and knowledge and get certified in CCNA, SSCP, Linux Plus, and so many more. Now, IT Pro TV has laid out all the tools you need. They'll, they'll actually provide you a fantastic IT education, and they'll also give you resources to help you on your journey. Now, get a learning coach, job resources, career path guidance, know that you'll always be supported with IT Pro TV's amazing team. Now, whether you're looking for yourself or your business IT team, IT Pro TV has a plan that will work for all of you. Now, not only do they have 5,800 hours of IT training, but they also are the official video training partner for CompTIA. They have Microsoft IT training, Cisco training, Linux training, Apple training, security, cloud, and more. Now, if you want more insight about IT, check out their podcast, TechNado. That's with Don Puzzit. He's featuring industry guests and IT news recaps for a deeper dive into the IT realm. IT Pro TV has some big news this month as well. They are now part of the ACI Learning. ACI Learning was formed earlier in 2020 and includes classroom IT training and instructor-led training in audit and IT audit and cybersecurity as well. Now, together, this is a new entity and it's able to train you in IT in any model, whether it's online, instructor-led, virtual, or on a campus. Don't let another year go by. Get a head start on your IT career with IT Pro TV today. Go to IT Pro dot tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise 30 to receive 30 percent off all consumer subscriptions that's it pro dot tv slash enterprise and use the code enterprise 30 for an additional 30 percent off 
for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, building or expanding your IT career and enjoy the journey. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Mike Bartell. He's the Director of Marketing Research and UX over at Toby Pro. And we talked a lot about eye tracking, but I do actually want to bring in my co-host here, uh, starting with Chibert, because Chibert, you've, you've actually worked with this before, right? Yeah, it was quite a while ago. I was working with uh, Dr. Martha Crosby, setting up a rig so that she could go and work with Boeing on measuring the effectiveness of the Boeing 777 glass cockpit. Now, that was quite a while ago. Now, I hear there's some really interesting studies out there, and I keep hearing rumors about how Major League Baseball used it. Mike, do you know anything about that study? Um, uh, there, okay, so there, there have been quite a few uh, applications of eye tracking within uh, sports across uh, basketball, baseball, hockey, soccer, kind of all across the gambit. Could you be a little more specific about which study you're referring to? One of our previous guests um, in the close of the show made a comment that for some reason or another, men check out a very various parts of the baseball players before anything else. And yeah, so. so yeah. Okay. It's almost yeah, like thanks. a cod piece effect, is what I was sure. told. Yeah, so the, I, I am aware of the study that you're referring to. This study wasn't actually conducted by Major League Baseball. I'm not exactly sure who did it, but uh, you know there are, there are some very serious and important research studies that eye tracking does, and some that are just a bit goofy. Uh, I, I think you're referring to one where they determined that men are much more likely to um, visually explore the athletic supporter region of a picture of a baseball player than females shown the same picture. Um, so yeah, that, that's a study that, that has gotten some attention and, and some interest over the years. And, and it does come up from time to time in, in interviews like this. Yeah, sorry. I, I just wanted to show that eye tracking is not just human computer interfaces. There's been eye tracking studies across an, a huge gambit. It's no longer super, super expensive. In fact, you know, maybe we ought to go and ask you what would it take for our viewers to go and get started with Toby on doing an eye tracking study of their own? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so like I said, the the range of uh hardware software services that are available are you know it's it's quite a range because it depends quite a bit on on what you're doing and what equipment you're using and how many locations and and all of these things um you know we have studies that have spanned years and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of these larger customers and we have studies that are Five thousand dollars or less. Uh, we we offer the ability to to rent eye tracking equipment for even less than that. So it is the kind of thing that's kind of available at at, at all price points for for a given company. So I do want to bring Curtis back in because he could put a little bit of an enterprise spin on it as well. Curtis, you know, well, I, I am curious. You you've talked about the the user interface side of things and i i'm familiar with that I mean, even in the communications industry we do a lot, a lot of things about you know trying to see how people are navigating a page to consume information uh, but my my real question is are there applications of eye tracking outside the development area i mean is this one of those things that is is of use in development but then it's over and done with, or do you have clients who use it throughout the life cycle of a product or service? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're correct to point out that during the development of an application or a website, that's an excellent time to use eye tracking. And it's a very common time that eye tracking is used. Um, but we do have a lot of customers who 
they either do uh, sort of iterative testing. So they'll test during the design phase and the learnings that they have about navigation and communication and content from that eye tracking study will inform their design. But then six months or a year later, they'll run the exact same test to uh, confirm that the, the insights from the original study were correct. And then they iteratively will make changes to the website as they go. Uh, we also have a lot of customers who they'll have a, a question. So for example, if it's a, an e-commerce uh, company and they've discovered that for a particular category of product, they're noticing that a lot of their customers put it in the cart and then for some reason they abandon the cart and, and don't end up purchasing the product. And what they're learning from surveys isn't really giving them the information they need on why this is happening and why people aren't following through with their purchase. Running a UX study that includes a full analysis of kind of that click stream along with a full analysis of their visual attention can kind of unlock secrets into why that might be. You're able to see what do they look at right before they take the item out of their card or right before they close the website. What's the information that they didn't notice that might have uh, compelled them to move forward and actually make that purchase. So that sort of exploratory research about existing research questions is another way that eye tracking is used aside from just to inform design decisions during the building of a, of a website or application. Okay. And, you know, a follow-up, and I'm going to ask you to, to look a little bit into the future with this, if you don't mind. Yep. Because you, you were talking about follow-up studies to, to go beyond just the basic development process. Um, even with the uh, glasses that you showed earlier, which are pretty non-obtrusive, pretty, uh, pretty simple as, as devices go, uh, I can imagine that they're not the sort of thing that most uh, employees, most users would be comfortable having on all the time just as, as a matter of course. But if you look at things like um, augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, which, whichever of those realities you want to talk about, I can imagine a scenario where those kind of devices do have eye tracking built in. And so eye tracking could conceivably become much more regular mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the way that we now get uh, things like time on site and, uh, you know, click count, click through all of those things. You know, can you imagine a scenario where eye tracking is just part of the normal metrics we get on sites and applications and services so that there can be this sort of continuous uh, improvement that we're used to out of, uh, you know, our Six Sigma and Agile disciplines? Yeah, uh, really good question. So to the point about incorporating eye tracking into VR and AR, um, I don't have to look too far into the future for that. It already is happening. Um, there are already uh, VR systems on the market that have eye tracking incorporated into, um, into the actual hardware itself. Uh, in terms of eye tracking becoming ubiquitous to the extent that it's being used on sort of a constant basis to improve design based on sort of um, data that's that's collected all the time. Of course, there are you know privacy concerns and and things that that a lot of listeners of your your show I'm I'm sure would would uh, would take very seriously. So that that's one of the the major roadblocks, um, and that's the primary reason I would say that. For, for the time being, the research that we're conducting is all with participants who specifically give consent to participate and are uh, paid for their time. And the data is only used uh, for a very specific purpose on a product or in a store or on a website. But, you know, um, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, but if I could look five, 10 years into the future, um, I would expect that, that eye tracking will continue to grow and will continue to be used and will start to be used in some of the ways that uh, that you've sort of pointed to. Right, right. Well, unfortunately, all good things must come to, the end, to an end. Mike, thank you so much for being here. We're running a little bit low on time. I do want to give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can go to learn more about Toby Pro and eye tracking. 
Yeah, thanks so much again for having me. Uh, really enjoyed it. Um, if anybody's interested in learning more about Toby Pro eye tracking, you can vi visit us at tobypro.com. That's T O B I I P R O.com. Um, on social media, you can find us at, at Toby Pro. Um, and we'd be happy to tell you more about uh, our technology and solutions. Fantastic. Thanks again for being here. Well, folks, you've done it again. You're set through another hour of the best day enterprise podcast in the universe. So tune your podcatcher. So it's why I want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my co-host, starting with the very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? Where can people find you? Well, as I was saying, we've got Black Hat Europe coming up next week. A lot of exciting stuff going on there. I've covered some of it. I've got more articles and interviews coming up at Dark Reading. Also, I have some other uh, things coming up at Dark Reading, including an exploration of one of the things we talked about today, some more about printer vulnerabilities and what you can do about them. Look for me at Dark Reading, and especially at the edge of Dark Reading, You'll find me pointing to my articles there on Twitter at KG4GWA. And also feel free to follow me over on Instagram, Kurt underscore Franklin. It's coming down to the end of the year and uh, have a couple of very interesting articles coming up that uh, I hope people enjoy as well as get some useful information out of. Thank you, Curtis. Well, we also thank our geek in paradise, Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, we know you're podcasting from a pod in your driveway what's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you okay well i'm my twitter address is adv and -E um, you, the pounding you hear in the background is actually the carpet guys and uh, the renovation on the house is getting finished up and if all goes well i will be finishing the packing finishing some electrical work in the house and getting ready to move to the sunshine state. Look forward to hearing from you. If you want to drop me a line with a show idea or comment or whatever, uh, I am Chebert at twit.tv, or better yet, you can use twiet at twit.tv and hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear from you. We've been getting some great show ideas, and, you know, we just like hearing from you. Thanks. See you again. Thank you, Cheaper. We do like hearing from everybody. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise and IT news goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and listen and to catch up on your IT Pro news. Go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, co-host information, guest information, and links to the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support, support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice and listen on any one of your devices and any one of your podcast applications because you know what? Subscribing is the best way to actually support the show. Now, you know what? After you subscribe, you should actually impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with giving the gift of Twyet because we talk a lot about some fun tech topics on this show, and I definitely think that they'll find them interesting and fun as well. Now, after you subscribe, we're also available 1.30 p.m. Pacific time on every Friday. We do the show live, live.twit.tv. You can watch us live. Come see how the pizza's made. Come see the behind the scenes and all the fun we have during the show. But also, more importantly, if you're going to watch the show live, you should also jump into the chat room as well. That's irc.twit.tv. There we have some pretty great characters in the chat room each and every week. We have some great discussions. We get some great questions from there. So definitely check that out, irc.twit.tv. Now, don't worry. If you can't watch the show live and you can't be part of the live discussion, that's okay. Because there's still a 24-7 discussion happening right now at Twit. Dot community really great website there's 24 7 discussion happening there's great community out there lots of content discussions and hosts and guest discussions and technology discussions out there so check that out twit.community remember you can always follow me at twitter.com slash lou i'm there i post all my enterprise tidbits plus i have some really great conversations with all of you plus I also post some of the things I do during my normal work week at Microsoft. So if you want to check some of that out, you can do dev.microsoft.com slash office. There we post all the latest and greatest ways to customize your office experience to make it more productive for you. 
I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support us each and every week doing this week in Enterprise Tech, and we couldn't do it with the show without them. I want to thank everyone at Twit as well as the engineers. I also want to thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the bookings and the plannings for the show, and we couldn't do this show without him. So thanks again, Chibert, for all your support throughout the years. And before we sign out, we have to thank our editor, Victor, he makes us look good in background there when he edits the show. And, of course, our TD for today, Mr. Ant Pruer. Ant, you are a busy, busy guy. What's going on for you the coming weeks and the holiday? Yeah, we're just trying to close out the year strong here at Twitch Studio. So make sure you subscribe, just like you've already said. Check out Hands On Photography and Hands On Wellness. Indeed, indeed. Some great content there. Well, thank you, everybody. Until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you. If you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, host at Twit TV. Got a question for you. Have you gotten tired of how bad your photos are looking every time you post them to Instagram? Better yet, have you gotten yourself a new camera and you can't quite figure out why the images just don't look that good? Well, I have a solution for you. This is my show, Hands On Photography. Each and every Thursday, I sit down and share different tips and tricks that are going to help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. So subscribe today at twit.tv hop to learn more.